Hello, hello. Good morning. Good. Can you hear me? Morning. Um, you sound a little choppy, actually. Yeah, I'm having to use my phone and I'm outside. Does it still sound choppy? Well, I think it's better now, but let's see how this rolls. Yeah, being in the country, the internet just doesn't work very well. Hey, you know what? It's all about what you make of it. So I'm sure right. you gotta make there she is. Now I see you. Good morning, everybody else who's joining us on this lovely Friday morning. How's it going, everybody? Somebody and wants to say hi to. <gasps> hi, Boogie. Hi, aunties. Aunties. All aunties. Boogie has all the aunties. Hello. Come here. I got somebody who wants to say hi. Look. Jeanette, what is that? Tur turkey, um, turkey bacon? Yeah, my husband made a grocery store run this morning. Uh -huh. It'd be illegal to call it bacon. It's turkey strips. <laughs> turkey strips. Okay, okay, I see it. Marnie, is that a golden retriever? She's part, um... Lab and Bulldog. Okay, love it. Um, let's let's wait like two more minutes for a few more people to join in. Um, in the meantime, you guys, if you can comment in the chat box, and for one, tell us where are you from, and for two, I want to hear what you all drinking this morning. What are y'all drinking? We got Jeanette, I think is Water. from Iowa. Sarah is from, is it Baltimore or Delaware? I always get confused with those two. I really don't know why. Um, Stephanie, where are you from, Stephanie? And Kathy, where are you from too? Sterling is from Mass. Carissa is all the way up in Big Bay. <laughs> Georgia water. Marnie's from Georgia. Palm Coast, Florida. Oh, yeah, I see that. Delaware, okay. I don't know why I always confuse Delaware with Baltimore. Marnie. Oh wait, more people. Yes. Oh. Oh. Ka wait, Kathy, you're from Delaware too? Wait, <gasps> it's your friend, Kathy. Now I'm putting the pieces together. I see it. Cool. This is amazing. I, man, I love this community so much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Marnie, are we, get, are we ready to get this party started or what? Yes, we are. Amazing. So, you know, you guys, today is really just, it's a heartfelt community conversation. Um, for anybody who has done the, man, more people are asking to join. For anybody who's done the, the quarantine wellness challenge, this is um, where you probably got introduced to, to Marnie for the first time. Um, I just, you know, for, for anybody who's, you know, putting in the effort to work with us, we, we really like to do our part and get to know them on a deeper level. But I had a conversation with Marnie and man, like it, it really struck me, like all of you guys are so inspiring and you know, there's a reason why you're here and all of you guys have a story to share. And we wanna help you to showcase that with, with the hopes of, you know, 
just inspiring somebody else. Like if anybody, if, if one of y'all's story can help to, you know, inspire somebody to show up better and to think differently that, you know what? Yes, I, I can be better regardless of what's happening and, and what I'm surrounded with right now, then, then that's a gift. Um, so for one, Thank you so much, all of you guys, for joining us this morning. Thank you for taking your time to, to drink your coffee or your tea or your water or whatever it is that you're drinking um, to, to raise your cup and um, sip as we're listening to this courageous conversation. But Marnie, um, you're a warrior woman, um, but today we're really going to get down to, to the root of it and why I, I'd like to call you this way now. Let's begin with the fact that, you know, something that we always say is life is 10% what happens to you and 90% of how you react to it. And, you know, it, it's not the weight that's, that we carry that's going to crush us, but how we carry it otherwise. Um, and Marnie is really a, a, a perfect example of, you know, having been struck with a real life-threatening situation and having overcome it um, on like a better note because of it. So using that as a source to propel her forward rather than playing victim mindset despite of what happened to her. So I think that you guys are all aware, um, and, and please type it in the comments because I wanna learn about your story too, that there are moments in your life that define you. Um, Marnie, and this question is to you. Did you always have the character that you have right now, or do you feel that the character that you have built is a byproduct of what happened to you? I've always had the, the, the character to do my best, strive to be the best. Growing up, I was very introvert, very shy. So in order to be recognized, I had to excel. I had to be at the top of everything so that I would be recognized. But, you know, I think I, it's just been instilled in me all my life. My mother is a very uh, dedicated, determined, strong woman. And I feel like I've, um, I've acquired that from her. But this, what happened to me, has made me even stronger. We're going to get to that in just a second. So now, Marnie, before we get to that, I want to ask you, what are the different roles that you play in your life? Um, I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm an accountant for an auto industry. I'm a health coach. Um, I'm a mama to a dog. Sister daughter and I also work with side by side with my trainer I help him in his classes to inspire others really I didn't know that you know that ha ha you'll find a lot, a lot about me but yes I have we are actually discussing partnering together I help him with the classes and um plan them and take over and just his right hand part of his right hand I guess you could say so if I counted this correctly, you have at least six different roles that you play in your life. Yes. So now, a couple of years ago, you had a, a life-threatening event, an, an extremely traumatic event. Now, can you tell us a little bit what that event was? Five years ago, 2015, it was in the fall. I had a severe sinus infection. I knew I had a sinus infection. I'm one that never got sick, and I hate doctors. So I wouldn't go to the doctor and it just got so bad. My husband finally said, do you want me to take you? And I, no, I'm going to go. Um, when I got to the doctor, my blood pressure was 200 over 100. What? Yes. I had no idea I had high blood pressure, never had any symptoms. They actually wanted to call an ambulance. And of course, as women, we tend to put everyone else, the care of everyone else before ourselves. And, you know, when she said you're at stroke level, I was like, no, I got to get back to work. My computer's still up. I got to get all this work to do. I got to let them know. She's like, you are at stroke level. I need to call an ambulance. You know, can somebody come get you? And my husband has a lot of issues. So, and we live 45 minutes from work. And I, I, I was thinking of him. You know, he can't come all the way over to get me. I went back to work. But when I got there, it hit me. So I called him and he came and got me. Um, I don't know how much, 
how far you want me to go into this, but that's I where want, it started. I want you to go deep. So, okay. so what do you mean when you say it hit me? Like, what did you feel? It hit me that, you know, you're telling me that my blood pressure is 200 over 100 and I'm at stroke level, but initially it just didn't, because I hadn't, I didn't have any symptoms. I was fine. They even asked me at the doctor's office, are you not, you don't feel like you want to pass out? You don't have a headache? No, I'm fine. Um, and when I got to the, I guess hearing his voice, it triggered, you know, okay, I need, I need him to come get me. Um, from there, we went back over to the office. They gave me a medicine called, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called clonidine and it, it, it rapidly brings your blood pressure down. My blood pressure was so high, one pill didn't work. I had to take two. So I was in a lethargic state for the entire weekend. Um, I went back on Monday. She ordered the test to have an uh, echocardiogram, <clears throat> an EKG, and an ultrasound of my carotid arteries. When that came back, she said that I had, they call it diastolic dysfunction, which is where your heart starts hardening due to the fact that you've had to, your blood pressure has been so high from it having to pump so hard to get the blood through your body. So it hardened your heart. It's also on the verge of um, congestive heart failure. That answered a question to where I was working, I was exercising and working out prior to this, but I was always out of breath. Just talking to someone, I couldn't breathe. Bending over, my, my air was constricted. And I, we didn't know why. And they, my, one of my doctors said, it's because you sit all day long, start getting up, moving around, stretch your diaphragm, that may help it, but it didn't. Uh, so, and I also have a, um, they call it a bicuspid regurgitation, which is where your valve's leaking. And I knew I had that. And I knew I had a heart murmur. Really what? I had a heart murmur and okay. a valve that's leaking. And I knew I had that. Um, so she wanted to get me into a cardiologist. And the one that she found was, it's going to be 30 days before I could see him. And something was just kept telling me, don't wait, don't wait. There's another renowned cardiologist in Columbus, Georgia that I was going to get in with. But then I got to thinking about it. It's like, she's, everyone goes to her. I don't want to be just a number. I want you to care for me and me be your number one at the time. I don't want to be a number. So I got to talking with a couple at church and they recommended their cardiologist. So I called him and I couldn't get in with him, but they had brought in a new doctor that could see me the next day. So I said, okay, this is, this is an answer. So I went to see him and he likes to order his own tests. So he reordered everything. Uh, I knew it was a sign from God because to be there because <laughs> Yeah, I'm very emotional. Um, okay, we're all going to get emotional today. He asked if he could pray with us. The first thing, and he's a, um, he was actually one of the cardiologists for one of the football teams. I can't remember which one it is, but it's in North somewhere. Can't remember. So he ordered all the tests. But in the meantime, while I'm waiting for all these tests, everything came back fine. My stress test came back fine. My cardiopulmonary came back fine. He saw the same things on the echocardiogram and the EKG that the previous doctor did. But um, because I had begun changing my diet more and exercising more, the diastolic dysfunction of the heart, the hardening of the heart has, had reversed. So, but he knew that there was something underlying, there's a cause when you have hypertension that comes on that quick and that high, there's something underlying in your body that's causing it. And he said, it usually comes from your renal. You get renal hypertension before you get actual hypertension. Um, but prior to this test that I was going to have the ultrasound, I was at work and that was that picture I had sent you, Sarit, but I was at work and all this was running through my head. Like, you know, what am I going to do? And I'm an accountant and I stamp a lot of things with a red stamper and I needed to fill it up. So I filled it up with ink, but it had a lot of excess on my bottle. I took a piece of paper and wiped it off and laid it down for it to dry so I wouldn't get it everywhere. I didn't immediately throw it away. I don't know why. But when I picked it back up, it was a cross with Jesus in it. Oh my 
Gosh. And his blood was puddled at the bottom. Um, that was my sign. I don't know if y'all are believers. It's hard for people to believe because they don't have something tangent. But God uses things in our life to speak to us. And he spoke to me that morning and told me that he had it. That I had to surrender it to him. And I did. I surrendered it and let it go. But when the test came back, we, the morning that I was supposed to have the ultrasound of the renal area, they had failed to tell me that I was not supposed to eat or drink or anything. And that morning as I was running out the door, I ate some, a bite of eggs. But when I got there, she said, you're not supposed to eat or drink. So it causes gas in your stomach, which you already have it anyway, but then it gets difficult to read it or find anything because of the gas. And then the insurance won't pay for it twice if you've got to come back and do it again. So she said, come back tomorrow because I had to go see my cardiologist and we'll do the test then. Well, when she did the test, when you have, uh, when I've had ultrasounds, the tech comes in and does her screening and tags whatever she needs to tag. And then her superior comes in and reviews everything. Well, that's what happened with me. And I'm thinking that's why she's in there. But the reason why she was in there was they found something on the scan and they immediately come in with a wheelchair and said, we're taking you to the ER. We've already talked to your doctor. We found something. And let me, can I just do a quick yes. recap real quick for, for anybody who has just jumped in over, over the last couple of minutes. So Marnie, just to make sure that we're all on the same page too, like Leading up to, you know, that day in, I think it was September of 2015, right? Was it? It was, it was October when they actually started doing all these tests. Oct oh. Latter October. This, okay. this was the first week of November. Okay. When they found all this and I had to go to the ER. Got it. But the first sign was, was in September where out of nowhere, like we're talking about would you say you were a healthy woman? Yes. Like you were, you were very active. Um, again, like yes. you said that you had the same character, but like one day your blood pressure like rose up to 200 over 100, right? And, and, and the EMTs were telling you that, you know, like you're in a state of getting a stroke and you know, you need, you need to go to the ER. You're like, I'm not feeling anything. Then you heard your husband's voice you heard a trigger and like, you know, you felt everything hit you suddenly. You went to the high blood pressure. I mean, you went to the ER and, you know, that's basically when the series of events had started occurring and they found yes. that your heart was hardening, right? That was the initial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was initial. I still did not know what was coming. Okay. So this is what we're getting to. Yes. Okay. This is the next thing. Okay. So when I get to the, when they roll me over to the ER, they immediately started hooking me up to everything. Um, <clears throat> they said they saw something in my stomach and I think they thought it was an aneurysm. I'm not sure, but she said, we've got to do a CAT scan. So they started hooking me every, up to everything. Um, when they did the initial CAT scan with the dye, the contrast, they found that my aorta is completely dissected within itself. You have three layers of your aorta. Two of mine had already separated away from the wall. So I only have one layer of my aorta left. At that point they said that, and I also have three, had three aneurysms. One was in the ascending of the heart, which is right before they, um, that they call it, I think it's the sinuses. I can't think of it, but it's right before it gets to the heart. It's the ascending part of the aorta. There was a 4.8 aneurysm there. I have two additional aneurysms behind the heart on the descending side. One's 4.3 and one's 3.8. So what I have, real quick, but, for anybody who's not familiar with an aneurysm, can, can you quickly describe what that is? Okay, what happens is when you have high blood pressure, your, your blood is pumping really, really hard. It's trying its best to get the blood through your body. And as it continues to do that at that high rate, it's constantly putting pressure in your aorta and pushing it out. 
stretching it out like a balloon, say to so to speak. You've got this big balloon on your aorta. And if that bursts, you will die. Right. It's, um, but what I have is called thoracic ascending aortic aneurysm and dissection. They initially treated me as acute um, and they panicked and I was in the hospital for a week. They were waiting, but well, they, they came to me in the emergency room. There was four doctors standing over me. One, there was a neurologist, a stomach doctor, I mean, four different doctors. And they told me, you're going to die if you don't have this surgery. They were consulting with Dr. Edward Chin at Emory in Atlanta as to how he's the renowned surgeon for this type of um, situation. They were waiting to hear from him to find out, for him to read my scans. They, uh, they had gone in and done a brain scan as well to make sure there was no aneurysms there. But the, um, they were waiting for him to decide whether I was to be life flighted or taken by ambulance to Emory for the surgery. Stayed in the week for, uh, hospital for a week and they kept my blood pressure as low as they possibly could because this is normally an acute situation. It's not, you know, they come back and they, after he had looked at everything, um, he said that he didn't feel like I needed the emergency surgery, that I needed to come up there and just consult with him, make sure my blood pressure stays low until I get up there. Mm -hmm. So I go from being told I'm gonna die to you're fine, you can, you, it's okay, you can go home. So then I went to meet with Dr. Chen and he described everything that was going on. And he says, what we would do if you have the, if you choose, cause they say if, when the center, the, when the aneurysm gets to five centimeters is when they usually go ahead and do the surgery. This, because I was at a 4.8, he was leaving it up to me to decide if I wanted the surgery or not. I already knew I wanted it. But after speaking with him, he said, you can live with this, but you're gonna have to keep your blood pressure below 120 over 70. I didn't want to live with a ticking time bomb in my chest. So I knew that I needed to have that surgery. And I already knew that I was going to be fine because I'd already surrendered it. I had the Lord with me. Mm. So he wanted me to go home, think about it. And so I thought, and it's, it, my husband was scared because, you know, he was thinking, oh, you can get pneumonia in the hospital. You can get this, you can get this. I, I can't, I can't think about that. I can't worry about that. I have to. I know that I'm going to be fine. And throughout all this, before I had the surgery, there's a song from Casting Crowns that would play everywhere my daughter and I would go, everywhere we went. Whether it was a restaurant, car, it's Just Be Held. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with that song, but it's talking about, um, I don't know the exact words I want to print out, but it's um, everybody needs you now so to speak, you've got to be strong for them, but it's just telling you, you need to stop, slow down, let me hold you. I've got you, I've got you. And that was his way of speaking to me. He spoke to me throughout all of this. Um, I had decided to go ahead and have the surgery. I had it on March 3rd, 2016. I went on, I came home on the 4th and in eight weeks I was back at work. Um, I immediately started walking and exercising, which is the key to your, um, recovery. And another reason why I did so well with it is because I was already physically active and getting healthy prior to it. But when he went in, he thought that he had told me initially that he was going to have to repair that one aneurysm, reconstruct my arch, and reinforce the descending portion of my aorta. But when he got in there, he um, said that the, the descending side and the arch were not as bad as he thought. So he just repaired the one um, aneurysm. But what I have is the same thing that took John Ritter's life. It took Lucille Ball's life. It took Albert Einstein. It took, um, what is his name? Alan Thicke. Uh, and back then they didn't know enough about it. And now it's, you know, it's, I'm still here today 
because I'm supposed to share my faith and share my story with others to educate others so they can learn more about it. Um, this is also connected to connective tissue disorder, which I don't have, morphine syndrome, and there's some other issues. But so I went through the genetic testing and I have a variation in my MYH11 gene, which is what I'm trying to remember how it's got to do with the muscles connecting tissues together. And so they're saying that what I have is chronic. I've, I've had it all my life. I've had my sibling, a couple of my siblings and my mother and my daughter tested and they don't have it. So we don't know exactly where it came from. I'm, I'm thinking it came from my grandfather because he had an aneurysm in his stomach. Um, so I just don't, and, and it's, they say it stops with me since my daughter doesn't have it. Her children won't have it. Um, my sisters don't have it, so their children won't have it. So they say it stops. It stopped with me, which is, I'm so thankful for. But, um, but this, instead of me, as you said earlier, when, when we started talking, instead of me sitting in the corner, crawling in my bed, being depressed and saying, oh, woe is me, why me? You know, why did this happen to me? I turned it around and have thrived with it. You have, and I wanna, and I wanna get to life after it. Um, just a second, for one, you know, thank you for sharing your story. This is just, it's real, it's raw. Um, to be honest, to be honest, it's scary as shit, and I have some personal questions to ask you. Just a second, but for anybody who's taking notes, um, you know, like what Marnie discusses is a true like life lesson that we all need to pay attention to. And I mean, if 2020 hasn't shown us enough of that, how vulnerable we all are as people yet, yeah, then this story definitely will. It's like, we're talking about somebody who's already like actively going out of their way to take care of themselves. Like imagine like waking up one day and like, your your physical being that you had already like you know put in so much time and effort to like you know really just like you know grow your garden and, and let it flourish like one day everything changes like everything changes so i mean between september to march i mean this whole like series of six months i mean it's scary as shit, right um but really important points that that you talked about, Marnie, and these are like really notes that I'm taking for myself because, you know, God forbid, like, will this happen to any of us? Like, we're all vulnerable, right? Um, but, you know, when something that's life-threatening that happens to you at such like an acute phase, you have, like, Marnie, you said this amazingly, like, you have to surrender, like, the power of faith. Um, and I also took notes uh, of what you said. You said, it's hard for people to believe because they don't have anything tangible to believe in, um, which is really powerful, but we have to surrender and, and we have to stop. We have to slow down and we have to assess. Um, and also we, we have to use our adversities as a generating force to empower others because it's going to give us a new redefined purpose. Uh, redefined purpose. So for one, Marnie, like, I mean, comment in the chat box, don't you agree that, I mean, she's like extremely like powerful, like, come on, like, Oh my gosh, like, it's insane. My question to you is, you know, when you were being told all these things, like, you know, you're not going to make it, we have to pray for you. Like, what went through your head and what were the things that you told yourself? It, it was just a shock. I mean, you just go into a state of shock and I just kept look at, looking at my husband like, what in the world is going on here? And the only thing that was going through my head was, I'm not ready to go. 
I can't leave my daughter. I mean, she was only 17, 18. I'm the only person that she has. Um, she has her stepdad, but you know, I can't leave her motherless. I'm not, I'm not finished. It was just, I mean, I, don't, I can't explain it. I think because of my faith and my relationship with Jesus, that I didn't have the worry or the, you know, I wasn't as scared once I surrendered it. I mean, it was just like an everyday thing to me. I don't know, I don't know if it's because I didn't have any symptoms. I don't know. I, just, I can't explain it. All I can say is this, it was the Lord was with me. He was carrying me. He wasn't finished with me yet. He was using me as his vessel. He put me through this storm to prepare me to share my faith and draw others to him to build my relationship, to make my faith stronger, and to help others. That is my purpose. My purpose here is to get others healthy. If I help one person in one day, I've done my job. Um, I want to inspire others. It's so important, especially now, to get healthy. Um, I mean, I just, I, it's, it's hard to explain. <laughs> Well, I think to add to what you said, I think today you can times up by 15 because I'm pretty sure that your story is helping to inspire at least 15 people who are on the live. And that's before the recording will be sent out to other people. But um, do you believe that we're all vessels? Yes, we're all, and you've said it in one of your um, talks before. Our journeys are already planned out for us before we're born. We choose how we want to travel that journey. Um, and God has a way of changing it, changing your, the, your directions. He has a way of stopping you in your tracks. Whether you vis visualize it and see it and take that direction is up to you. But um, I strongly believe we are his vessels. We are here for a purpose. Um, we may not know what our purpose is yet. You may not know what your um, gift is. I know what my gift is now. My gift is to help others. Do you believe that some of the most redefining moments of our lives are actually traumatic events? Yes. I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you believe that in order for somebody to understand that they're a vessel it's imperative that they stop and they slow down yes you have to stop and, and be silent you have to listen you're being you're being spoken to all of the time we're in such a fast paced environment we're always on the go and always running we don't take time to slow down and enjoy the things around us and listen you're you can be spoken, it could be a bird singing to you and, and it could mean something. It could be, I mean, it's, he uses everything around us to open our eyes, but we have to sit and listen to it. That's why you have one mouth and two ears. You have two ears to listen. Oh, good. Ah, this is so good. Okay, so I have a question for you. I truly believe that your belief system shapes your reality, right? And when you, when you were being struck with, with such an event, right? Like you have to hold on to your belief system because that's basically like your internal programming. So now in order to, to keep on keeping on, right? I mean, you know, you mentioned some names of people who literally like made such a, like like made such an impact on the world who literally have died from the same thing and i truly believe it's because emotionally like they gave up and you didn't you're like i'm not ready for this did she leave us uh oh <laughs> what's up everybody <laughs> i like great you go 
It's probably her connection. If not, we're just gonna have a chat here. You guys, how are you liking this story so far? Unmute yourself. I have found that I have to surrender too. And um, Sarah has really, Sarah, I've been friends with Sarah since I was at my fattest <laughs> and started CrossFit. And I had to surrender. My biggest challenge is food. I um, love sugar. I'm a sugar addict. And when I gave up sugar I and flour, I was angry, very angry. And I had to mourn the loss of what food used to do. And it used to numb me. It was my drug of choice. And I had to surrender that. And that was very difficult. It was a loss. And um, so now in round two of what I'm going through now with this, um, and then I got pregnant and that stopped me in my tracks with a miscarriage. Um, and so now round two is difficult, but it's not as difficult because I've done the hard work of mourning the loss of the food and it is surrendering. It's very, it's difficult, but it's the best thing that we can do for ourselves. Yeah. 100%. We, we all have to surrender. And I think that's why like sometimes it, it takes like, uh, like a, some kind of traumatic life event to really like, kind of like shake you and say like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you need to stop this shit. Um, so, so that's amazing because when you surrender, like that's an opportunity to change the trajectory for the rest of your life forever. And, you know, um, I was just asking Marnie this, but Sarah, I mean, amazing job on your end. I know that, you know, like you've struggled with food for a really long time and you're definitely like on your way up. Um, but it's like, as you become that person, like you, you realize that you become a vessel, right? And it's like, now it's trickling down to, to Kathy and, you know, Kathy in your own journey is going to trickle down to somebody else. And I mean, really that is, that is the beauty of this. Um, and that's why Aaron and I had wanted to start with this community because, we know that, I mean, only through the power of community can we all make the impact that we need to, but also show up as our best selves. Because for you, Sarah, now, like, if you are a source of inspiration for Kathy, that's like, you know, accountability for you because you've struggled as well. We're all in this room because we've struggled, right? But when we, and this is something that Marnie said for her, her why was her daughter. She's like, I wasn't ready to let my, you know, to leave my daughter. Like we all have this one person that we're like, we, we want to be here longer because of them. And, you know, for some of you guys, it could be your kids. It could be your spouse. It could just be like your love for life or your love for your purpose, whatever <laughs> it is. But, you know, like for as long as you have that, like, you know, you are a source of inspiration for others. Um, and it's just, it's beautiful. Jennifer is asking to come in, but Marnie's not. So I wonder if Marnie's um, phone battery died or something. We don't know. This is an interesting conversation. Anybody else has anything to add? Kathy, thank you for sharing that. Kayla, Kayla said she's crying ugly tears. Kayla, you've been a source of inspiration. I wonder what magazine she's reading. <laughs> it's a cookbook. What cookbook is that? Uh, it's my, my lady boss cookbook. Okay, amazing. What are you making this weekend? Uh, this weekend, I don't know. I haven't got that far. Um, I really, I do it first thing in the morning when I get up. I kind of plan out my day, look at what I've got. And uh, the baby kept me up most of the night, so I'm getting a late start on my day. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you're crushing it. I, I think I saw you making breakfast or something a little bit ago. Yeah, um, protein pancakes. The kids were having pancakes this morning. I wanted pancakes, so I made my, my protein cakes and uh, had some zucchini. You guys, she's back. I don't know what happened. <laughs> hey, you're lucky that we all love one another. We, we actually <laughs> had a blast, and Kathy was talking about how moved she is by you, and, and Kayla is figuring out um, how she's going to level up the health of her family um, today and this weekend. Um, but um, I'm not sure where we left off. I, I remember that I asked you about how you felt and, and what kept you going and, and that was inspiring. But we got into your belief system, right? Mm -hmm. And how your belief system shapes your, re shapes your reality. I believe that your belief system shapes your reality because your belief system is your internal programming. So you end up manifesting it. You know, whether you believe in a universal power, a higher power, Jesus, God, it doesn't matter. I know there is one. If you don't, that's totally fine. Um, but, you know, as far as your own belief system goes, um, what are words that you use to describe yourself that, that give you that boost? I mean, you don't just overcome something like that by, by not having like a belief system or like, words that you use on a daily basis to to describe yourself i'm a survivor i'm um i don't know strong very strong dedicated determined um driven what driven oh yeah i forgot to print it <laughs> thank you um i just don't allow I think I don't know. I don't. I, I'm just driven. That I would say driven. I'm determined to not let my illness, my disease, define me. Oh, it, powerful! It will not define me. I will not allow it to overcome me. Um, we see. We see that like crushing so many people. Like letting their disease define them. Yes. Yes. Like, with me, there's a, go ahead. There's a, there's a lot of things that I do that I'm probably not supposed to be doing. Like I will never, ever be able to deadlift. Mm -hmm. Never. I do do it with de with dumbbells, but there's things they told me that my limit was 30 pounds. That's not my limit. I don't, I don't allow that to be my limit. Um, they don't know enough about it to, to, to tell you what you can and can't do. Right. Me, okay, we all, we not, not, none of us know when is, our day is coming. So why am I going to sit here and sulk and say I can't do this and I can't do that because it may kill me? I'm going to live my life to the fullest. And if working out, exercising is what's making me happy, making me feel good, that's what I'm going to continue to do. You know, I may not even die from this disease. I may die in a car accident. I mean, who knows? So why are you going to sit back and sulk and feel sorry for yourself when you can get out there and thrive and fulfill, live a fulfilling life and help others as well? So Marnie, that is a really important point that um, I know I've been living my life this way um, because I've gone through some adversities myself. I'm sure we all have, but you know, this is a point that anybody who's taking notes, like write that down, like never let an adversity redefine your destiny. Um, because if you stay in your shell because you're acting out of fear, then you're not living your best life. And something that Mar Marty put that really helps to put into perspective, like what if today is my last day? Like how would I want to spend it? Like if we start thinking about our lives in this way, I believe that people in life make poor choices because they think they're invincible. So, you know, they, 
they eat all the trash food, they drink all the trash alcohol, they go into drugs, like they, they do crazy things because they believe that, that they're invincible, right? But when you live your life in a certain way that you understand that everything is so fragile and today could be your last day, that everything is temporary, then that helps you to, to, to design your day which by default helps you to design your life. There isn't always tomorrow. It's just that most of us think that there is always a tomorrow, right? Um, but I think that it's something that's very freeing. Um, and if you don't live your life that way yet, then I challenge you to start doing it because I know that mm -hmm. it will free you. Marty, do you believe that there is um, a blessing behind the adversity? that you've been facing? I think there is um, what it is yet. I'm not sure. Um, my blessing is that I'm able to continue to be here, to live, live with my daughter, to see her graduate college, to see her become the missionary that she's longed to be, to, uh, there's so many blessings in it. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it is yet, all of it yet, but yes, there is a, there is a blessing behind it. I love it. I love it. So you're, ever since, you know, you've been struck with this situation, do you take more time to, to reassess every situation and like slow down and, and really like acknowledge it? Or do you just kind of like, go through life at the same pace that he used to beforehand I, I do i slow down i look at everything now i don't worry like i did um i take in more i take in more nature which i've always loved nature but i i admire things more i sit and look at how things are created i so to speak, value things a lot more, value my time, value, because before I was in a rat race, running. I mean, I'd drive 40 minutes to work, I'd go to work, I'm an accountant, I work eight, nine hours, come home, I'm with my daughter, you know, just running, 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 and never, barely had time to breathe. And this has slowed me down and caused me to not really worry about things. If it's out of my control, why worry about it? I can't change it and it's I don't know if you can see my shirt but my shirt says become mm. and what that means way that I interpret it way we do with our health coaching is you must unbecome something in order to become what you want to become Woo! so I wear the shirt all the time <laughs> And this is so powerful for everybody, you guys, because we all have this one thing that like we're, we're clinging to that's holding us back, right? Um, for most of us in here, it's food and sugar. And you need to become detached from something in order to become attached to something else. Can, yes. you, re can you repeat that statement again? Um. I say it this way. I may be saying it wrong, but you must unbecome in order to become what you're wanting to become. I mean, you, you, you've got to, in order to become what you want, you've got to unbecome your search, certain situation right now, what you're in right now. You've got to unbecome, unbecome to become is what it is. I love it. Um, okay. So this, so, 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 I want, I want you to give some advice from your own life experience real quick. Um, you know, 2020 has been a, a tough time for, for, for everybody, right? Like we're all noticing that we are vulnerable. We, we are fragile. Um, you know, for somebody who's struggling right now, who's just like in a mental funk or, or life is just coming at them. And we know that if life comes at us, it comes at us in, in multiple ways. The power of threes, we like to call it. What would be your word of advice for anybody who's currently going through a tough time? Try not to 
I'm trying to try not to dwell on the situation. You have to seek, search yourself with deep. Um, I always look at the positive sides of things. Negativity, negativity. Um, well, let me rephrase that. Worry is where is the dark room where negativity is developed. So if you're sitting there worrying, all it's going to do is hinder the situation. It's going to make it worse. It's, it's, worrying is going to get you nowhere. So we should always look at the beautiful things, the, the bright side of things, um, and strive to be our best. Every day is a blessing. Every breath is a blessing. And so you should use that blessing as a time to improve yourself, make yourself better. There's always a way to become better. And just, I just say, don't, I have been a worry wart all my life and it's gotten me nowhere. So I have decided, you know, I don't worry about things anymore. You know, my daughter's going to school and my, her school debt is through the roof, but I'm not worried about that because she's fulfilling her dream and I get to see it. I get to be with her. Mm. Life is too short, way too short. You have to um, just love the, your life, just enjoy it, be happy. Yeah, this is powerful. So let, let's talk about, you know, where it is that you're going. What is your ultimate goal? To stay alive. Um, after I had my heart surgery, I joined a optimal health program. I lost 20 pounds and that kick started my health journey. Um, I started with my trainer and my ultimate goal is just to stay physically fit. I want to become more ripped, more um, muscles. I want to build my muscles more. Um, and it, my ultimate goal is to extend my health coaching business to partner with my trainer and become a health coach, a trainer with him. Um, I live in a very, very small town, so we don't have a lot of people. But So I really couldn't build that business there. It would have to be something virtual. But it's just to, to stay involved in the health and industry and the fitness side of it and to just strengthen that and extend it even further, even, you know, through to others. So you said, you said a magical phrase that involved two words. I don't know if anybody caught on to that. If you did, I want you to drop it in the comments, but this is for everybody. I don't even know what I said. <laughs> That's okay. I caught it. Okay. Anybody knows? If so, comment it. So the two words that you said were stay involved. The only way, right? We are all going through shit, right? Like we don't even need to get to it. But the only way to, to like, like Marnie said, to change your perspective and instead of worrying, um, focus on the positive and just be, is to stay involved in something that matters to you. So for Marnie, something that matters to her is her health, because health to her is a meaning of life. Because if she's healthy, she's alive. And if she's alive, then she can spend more time with her daughter, right? Therefore, she's staying involved. That is her why. So for each and every one of you guys, my challenge for you is, you know, Stay involved for in in what matters more to you. And again, like I, I'm like I get vulnerable all the time, and I'm telling you this like selfishly too. That's why we're so involved in our community, right? Because to us, staying involved in our community and us building our community is a meaning for life, empowerment, right? Like. We, we feel like we can share our voice and our thoughts 
with like-minded people who know that they deserve to, to live a better life. That yes, you can have it all as a woman, regardless of what you know the naysayers, the haters have to say. Yes, you can have it all. So my challenge for everybody is stay more involved because it's going to change your perspective about life and also about what it is that you're capable of. Oh my gosh, that puppy is so freaking so cute. cute. Um, Marnie, my love, do you have anything else to add? Um, just, you know, like you said, you, you've got to dig deep into your why. There's several, seven levels of your why that I had posted. Um, you know, you can say, oh, I want to lose weight because I want to feel better. But why do you want to feel better? Oh, I want to be here for my children. But why do you want to be here for your children? Well, I want to be able to watch them graduate. But why do you want to you, you got to get, there's that last question is the, the underlying reasoning as to why you want to do this. Um, you have to do it for yourself, number one. I don't do this for anyone else. Yes, I do it because I want to be here, but I'm only doing this for me. And whether you accept it or agree with it, that's on you. I do this for me. Um, I've done a lot of changes in my life. My, I've lowered my blood pressure medicine. I, my cholesterol level is better than it's ever been in my life. It's, it was better than my doctors. My doctor even said they wish that they, theirs was like mine. Um, you have a bigger line, baby. Yep. I have, um, I'm trying to think what else, um, what else did I get rid of? Yeah, I've reduced that medicine. I'll take, I'll have to take that medicine the rest of my life, but I've reduced it from 40 milligrams to 10 milligrams. I've gotten my, uh, you know, the blood pressure medicine. Since I've been home, I don't have as much stress. So I've even reduced it. Uh, so you just have to really, really do it for yourself. Um, and no one else, no one else. Uh, I'm trying to think what else could I tell you. Uh, I had something else and I then lost it. Um, but just, you know, just, just really dig deep into your why. Really ask yourself, why am I doing this? And you have to stay focused, stick to it. Don't let anyone else tell you that, you know, you're crazy. You don't need to be doing this. I mean, I've even given up meat 15 months ago and everybody's telling me I'm crazy, but I'm doing that for me. I'm, I have to stay alive. You know, I can eat food without seasoning because I know I can't have salt. I can't have sodium. You, you do what you have to do to live. And when you're faced with it, it's, when you're faced with that situation and nothing's going to stop you from doing what you need to do. You do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. I love it. So many notes, so much wisdom. Marnie, man, like you're amazing. And you know thank that you, thank you, thank you. You know that we are all rooting for you. Um <laughs> definitely here on, on Team Marnie. Um you're awesome, stay awesome. All of you guys, you're all awesome. Um I wanna make a post later today and I will, um, you know, to challenge you guys to think about your seven levels of your why. Because when you really are clear on your why, you're gonna be able to be so much more focused and determined because like Marnie said, you have to do what you have to do. And so many times in life we stop because we make excuses, but that's because we're not clear in our why. In order to be successful in anything in life, Yes, we have to create simple ways of becoming more thorough with our actions. However, sometimes like we have to embrace the suck and just get it done, right? And, and this is how you become. Um, so going into this weekend, let's all unbecome in order to become better than we were yesterday, you guys. It's always been, it's always a pleasure, Marnie. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your wisdom. This community- Thanks for having me. Um, of course. Wasn't she amazing? Isn't this story so inspiring, you guys? Thumbs up. There we go. Double Thank thumbs you guys. up. Y'all stick to it. Don't give up. You got that. All right, you guys, have an amazing weekend, a very happy Friday. Hi, Erin. I'm here. I just make things take too long because I talk too much. 
So I sit to the, I sit on the bench. I sit You're on the side. I love you guys. Have an amazing day. We'll Great catch you on Monday, 6.30. Bye. Bye. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Bye.